Uh, thank you all uh, so much for joining us at the end of the day um, here today. Uh, we are thrilled to be here. Um, uh, my name is CJ Lewis, and I am the program manager for a program at the University of New Hampshire called PowerPlay Interactive Development. And we are a interactive applied uh, theater troupe that uh, works throughout the country uh, designing and implementing uh, interactive um, professional development trainings for uh, folks in higher ed, folks in the public sector, the corporate sector, uh, really anywhere that human beings have to deal with other human beings, which is, as we found, pretty much everywhere. Um, and we hope that, uh, that we have something a little bit different for you today. Um, and in fact, I'm going to askew podium etiquette and move this way. Uh, um, uh, PowerPlay uh, started uh, working uh, with uh, New Hampshire Sea Grant as well as the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension through, um, with the support of a grant from the Consensus Building Institute uh, in fall of 2018. Uh, is there anyone from CBI in the room right now? Excellent. Hello. Um, and um, uh, we set out to uh, sort of address the human aspect of managed retreat uh, by using actors and theater pedagogy to do that. Uh, that's what power play does. I also want to acknowledge the fact too that uh, for those of you walking in to something labeled an interactive theater session, I, I do recognize your fear when we combine those two words. That is probably the most terrifying phrase on the planet, interactive theater. Uh, you do not have to do any acting <laughs> in the next hour. I promise you. Yay, yeah. Did you feel the tension just sort of leave the room? <laughs> yes. I watched you all fill the back first. Yeah. Um, but what the next hour is going to be, we hope it's very unique. Um, because this is going to be an opportunity for uh, you to from what I understand, continue diving into the human and the emotional elements around this idea of managed retreat today. Uh, we are going to present a very brief um, series of monologues that hopefully open up uh, some of the more nuanced issues and complexities uh, involved with the human beings that are dealing with these issues every day. And we're actually going to give you a chance to interact with these characters from the comfort of your chair. You're going to be able to ask them questions. You're going to be able to dig into their motivations. And you're going to have an opportunity to dialogue amongst yourselves about what that all means. So um, before we get more into this, I just want to provide a little bit of context for where this is coming from. So um, my colleagues and I at PowerPlay and at UNH, uh, we, we, we asked ourselves this question in the fall, or we sort of, this was the challenge that we decided that we wanted to rise to. Uh, this fact that it is vital to recognize stakeholders' multiple perspectives on managed retreat if we want to have productive conversations about it. And at the core is this idea that there are a lot of voices in the room, as I'm sure you've noticed over the last two days of this conference, and there are a lot of different, unique, and conflicting perspectives around this idea, and a lot of tension, too, and a lot of emotion. Uh, because we believe that there are limits to starting conversations about managed retreat when the approach relies primarily on the sharing of technical information. Um, our expertise as theater practitioners um, and actors is uh, much different than yours. <laughs> we are not experts on climate change, on coastal adaptation, on best practices or solutions. But what we are experts in is human behavior and human dynamics and emotional responses. So this is sort of the lens that we're taking to sort of examine this issue. Uh, we sort of see it as a, as a combination of uh, the arts and sciences 
and outreach and engagement, and right in the middle is what we like to call our applied theater lab. And we like to use the frame, we like to use the phrase lab and laboratory because it is really uh, an opportunity and a tool to experiment with human beings. Um, I want you to think about the actors that you're about to see as your lab rats for the next hour. <laughs> um, we call this it's a rehearsal for the future. It's an opportunity to have difficult conversations. Uh, in a safe way with no risk to you at all. We're here to sort of bear the emotional burden of these difficult conversations. And ultimately, this is an opportunity to hopefully generate empathy for some points of views uh, that you might disagree with, uh, that might frustrate you, uh, and that might really be emotional for, for you and the people involved in the conversation. And it's an opportunity to really embrace the diversity of folks' circumstance, background, position, point of view. Um, so as, you're, as, as you watch uh, the, the scenes unfold here today, um, I want you to, to think about what, what seems familiar here. What do I identify with? Um, have I seen these people before? Do I deal with these people on a regular basis? Do I work with these people on a regular basis? Uh, is this, what is this bringing up in me? Uh, because ultimately, we're going <laughs> we're gonna to have an opportunity to, as, as I said earlier, sort of dig in and experiment with all of this. And I want you to equip yourself with two questions as you watch this today. What am I seeing and hearing? And most importantly, what more do I want to know about these people? Uh, what isn't being said? Is there something more under that statement? Is there something more under that comment? So um, I want to get right into this. Uh, we uh, spent about two months in the fall of 2018 conducting interviews um, with a number of people uh, in the New Hampshire Seacoast region where uh, we live, work, and play. Um, and uh, we talked to three specific groups of stakeholders. Uh, we talked to folks who identified as scientists. We talked to folks who we identified as municipal and civic leaders. And we talked to folks who we primarily identified as residents. Um, can I just, I'd just like to get a sense of the room. Who in here primarily identifies as a scientist or a technical assistance provider? Great. And what about uh, municipal and civic leaders? Excellent. And is there anyone who's sort of wandered in and identifies primarily as a homeowner or residence. Excellent. And, and, and importantly as well, who identifies as a boundary spanner? So somebody who sort of straddles one or more of these. Great. Excellent. Um, we're gonna, you're going to hear from each of these characters here very shortly. Uh, and actually, I'd like to invite them on stage right now. <laughs> So this is Susan, Catherine, and Jim. Uh, Susan is our municipal leader, Catherine is our scientist, and Jim is our resident. Uh, and they reside in the fictional town of Rocky Point. And they have sat down with you, their trusted confidant, over your favorite beverage, and they're going to talk to you about some things that are on their mind, uh, about what's going on in Rocky Point right now, especially around this issue of managed retreat. Uh, they are not in the same room together. They are isolated, uh, and you are going to hear from them. And I just want to remind you about those two questions I asked you to equip yourself with. What am I observing, and what more do I want to know? Okay, I'm just going to say it. We need a superstorm to hit this area. We need a wake up call. My name is James, but my family, friends, everybody in the neighborhood calls me Jimmy, and that's what I go by. Now let me be clear, I don't love that I said that. I don't like wishing ill on other people. I'm a scientist, 
I'm a pragmatist, but I have a heart. Yes, I'm a coastal resident, but uh, my property's um, uh, two blocks from the beach. We live on the marsh side of downtown. We call it our special view. It's been our summer haven for 35 years now. It's our pride and joy. We're at a crucial moment. We need to ratchet up everyone's urgency around this topic of coastal adaptation and managed retreat. I'm Catherine, by the way. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Hi, um, my name's Susan. Uh, I have worked for the town, gosh, must be 30 years now. I started as a planner and have been lucky enough to serve as a municipal leader and town councillor for most of that time, off and on. Every time I say I can't do this anymore, I come back. I love the service aspect of the work. So I spend October through March over in Pinewood, and then we get over here, and as soon as it's warm enough to crack the windows without bursting the pipes, we open up the house. Been doing it, like I said, 35 years. Don't see any reason to change now. Although, Things are changing. I, every time we come back, uh, something new on the strip, some big house, condos, store, makes you wonder who's buying all the stuff and why the town lets them build. I mean, we got all this flooding. I don't know, beats me. I'd like to think I know our constituents pretty well. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We're definitely a city, especially for this small state. We're, we're a community first. At least that's the way I see it. It's growing now, and quickly. We're getting to a tipping point on this issue of coastal adaptation. We need to be having bigger conversations around resilience, as well as, I know some people don't like the phrase, managed retreat. We're dealing with some municipal bodies and a citizenry not oriented in the right direction. Managed retreat? I'm not familiar with that term. Was that a war term? Well, I mean, what's it got to do with my property? Why am I nervous all of a sudden? Yeah, I've heard the term managed retreat. Frankly, I don't like it. It feels too authoritarian to me. This issue has been coming up more and more over the last few years, though when we talk to climate scientists about it, they package it more warmly. I've heard coastal resilience a lot lately. I don't mind that. Um, I think we're a very resilient community. Oh, I get it. it. It's a climate change thing. They were talking about it at the last town hall meeting I went to. Some people were getting really upset. Uh, one lady was yelling. I mean, I, I get it. It's you know, got to be a real pain moving your car every tide. I mean, I'm glad I don't have to do it. <laughs> that would be a pain in the ass. Uh, but, you know, I mean, if you got the kind of money, you can afford to, you know, live with that view, I'm sure. Uh, uh, it uh, floods in our neighborhood, too. But 20 years ago, put the house up on blocks so we don't worry about much damage. Uh, I mean, actually, since I'm away so much of the year, I don't go to a lot of planning meetings, so I'm not really looped in. I just, you know, do whatever works for me. We've been trying to build relationships with community leaders. There's just so much bureaucracy. You never quite feel like you're talking to people. You're sort of talking to the system. The system doesn't give you feedback in real time, and the system can be intimidating for everyone. Occasionally, I get to go out on a conservation project and actually speak one-on-one -on -one with residents or civic leaders. That can be encouraging but I can't have individual conversations with everyone in the region, now can I? I understand that this is an important topic, I do, and I want to see the conversation happen because I want what's best for the people who live here. But there's just so much information to take in and consider. It's fast and overwhelming, and it's frustrating too. You know, I trust the science folks who are bringing this to us. I see how much they care and how important this issue is to them. But I do feel like I'm being talked down to sometimes. A lot of us do. I'm interested in the work. 
and I'm, I'm passionate about the topic. I want to be a catalyst for change in this region, in this community. So I get enthusiastic about it. I've had some city councillors tell me privately that I might be coming on too strong or aggressive in my approach. I don't know how I feel about that. I've done the research, it's here. Why won't you pay attention to it? The way a lot of us see it is, just because it's good information to you doesn't mean it's good information to me. And what good is this information if we don't know what to do with it? You can't just drop a document on my desk and then get frustrated when I don't do the right thing. I think a lot of these more academic types are motivated first by getting their grant dollars. Sure, they care, but they have uh, research they want to do and articles they want to publish. Trust me, nobody in this town who is involved in this issue is reading those articles. Don't tell them I said that. Sure, I'd like to see the town do something about the flooding issue. I mean, I pay taxes. Use them. Let me back that up. I want them to do something as long as it doesn't infringe on my rights or my property. Like, suddenly, the crushed rock that I have in my driveway, suddenly it's not porous anymore. I mean, you see what I mean? They, they make a decision, then they change their minds. I mean, how can I trust they'll make the right decision for me? Look, I get it. The town is scared. There's no easy political course of action for the t them to take. So how do they think about a long-term issue like this one? Some people are less ready to talk than others. And that's definitely true the higher up you go in leadership. There's more at stake the higher up you go. But when does this factual scientific issue become a political one? And what do we as experts do when it gets to that level? I guess it's not our choice when we get to that point, which is too bad. We're a little out of sync. It's, um, it's like we're not even speaking the same language. I think what would be helpful for us is to have our hands held a little bit, you know? Uh, we need a plan. We can't use your ideas without a plan. There's a disconnect because it just all seems so vague. We need help implementing this. It's not their job to decide what's best for the people. This is a conversation and a long-term relationship that needs to be built. It's okay if your urgency is different than ours. And property owners are crippled by inertia. So they're not preparing for the worst. They are uncertain about what the best move is to make or they don't see a point in a lot of this. People think that these storm surges or fires like out in California are once in a lifetime events. They aren't. They're gonna happen again and again and again. So when they say managed retreat, they mean forcing us out? I'm not a retreater. I'm a fighter. I don't think it's going to be that bad. Plus there's this ethical dilemma that people are facing. Selling my property, is that the right thing to do? How can I in good conscience sell my property knowing that the next buyer is purchasing a ticking time bomb? Look, people want to keep their property. It's as simple as that. A lot of people ask me, I think I'd be able to sell it. And I thought about it. This place is so special. I want to see my great grandkids use this. I mean, you know, but if I had to sell it, I could and I would. People say, well, Jimmy, who's going to buy property that's flooding now and is going to keep flooding? So, I don't really see where that's my problem. Who says I have to tell them? They buy property in the neighborhood and it floods. 
It's up to them to figure it out. Or they can take it to the town. <laughs> Good luck with that. It doesn't seem like everyone's on the same page, even within the scientific community. Don't tell my colleagues I said that. I think we've just embraced the fact that this is going to be an ongoing conversation for years and years and years. We could get into the economics of it and the potential loss to our tax base over time, but I'd like to get some sleep tonight. A lot of my colleagues are talking about 50-year plans, 75 to 100-year plans. I want actionable items now, things we can be doing in six, five, two years. There are a lot of ideas out there, but sometimes it just stops there. And that's not a terribly popular opinion either. It can be tricky. There's a lot of trust that needs to be built, and the faces keep changing. We're working hard to develop long-term trust with our residents, our technical assistance providers, and all our stakeholders. But there are a lot of different perspectives that need to be represented. There are a lot of different oh, vocabularies and values at play here. I don't see how we're going to make everybody happy. I guess I never gave too much thought to the weather. I mean, I know Hurricane Sandy was bad, but they bounced back, right? I mean, I just roll with the things that Mother Nature throws at me. I mean, we'll be okay. We always have been. It's our happy place. It's blessed. And if one day I wake up and I'm drowning in my house, so be it. I had a good run. What are you going to do? I've got a lot on my plate as it is, and this is a huge issue. and probably won't be solved till long after I'm gone. I mean, what do you want me to do? And that's the trillion-dollar question, right? What are they going to do? And that is the question we're here asking today, right? What are we going to do? Yeah, take a, take a breath if you need to. <laughs> sure, give the actors a round of applause. Uh, so, um, we did not prepare a play here today to come and talk at you about what we think is going on or what needs to happen. This is a springboard for all of this expertise in the room to continue talking, right? Um, with these folks as a reference point right now for the next 40 minutes. So I wanna go back to that first question I asked you all. What did you notice? What stuck out to you? And please use your uh, microphone buttons as well. Yeah. Great. So iner did anyone else pick up on that sense of inertia from everybody? <clears throat> right? It's crippling. It can be crippling, right? It's... It's almost easier to give over, give up. Mm -hmm. Do you have a comment, sir? Well, it's part of your instructions that they were talking to themselves and not each other. <laughs> sure. Some of that's by design here theatrically a little bit too, right? We didn't actually see people talking to each other. If we want, if we find a moment and we actually want to see a conversation between any of these characters, we can look at that too. So think about that. So, yes. I was just going to say there seemed to be a fundamental disconnect between the kind of scientific worldview that probably represents the majority Could of the people. Marcus, thanks. I can just brush your teeth at home, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the dentist always has the worst teeth, right? <laughs> yeah. So there seemed to be a fundamental disconnect between the sort of scientific mindset of we've got to do something now versus the more
Absolutely. So we have this, this massive imbalance of urgency amongst these three characters, right? This needs to happen in five years. This needs to happen in 100 years. Uh, who knows what else the civic leader is dealing with on a daily basis as well. Um, what else? What else did you notice? Yes. I'm, I'm, do you mind if I dig into that? You use that word inadequate. Um, are, do you, is that a top level feeling or a, or a personal feeling or human feeling? I think it's a human feeling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, one thing we're really interested in as practitioners of this work in particular, th these, are, these are huge questions, right, with, sig with significant impacts. We're at a, we're at a really critical moment uh, when it comes to coastal adaptation and managed retreat. And a, a lot of the time, and really what this is an effort to do, is how do we distill those huge top-level conversations down to the human element? Right? Do, do, do those inform each other? Yeah. Yes, sir? We also speak to, to all speak to the fact that people should be in the same space like Kenny did in the island when he said about how they feel. Great. Great. Uh, so you, you observed a, uh, an inability for people to speak their minds with each other, right? That's. It's a good segue. Um, is there anything more you want to know from any of these characters? Yes, ma'am? Hesitancy because of <laughs> yeah we um we presented this last Friday up in Kittery, Maine at a small conference, and um, one of the participants. He said, I want to I I point something out. I want to acknowledge something. This is to your point. This is a distinctly American problem. <laughs> but, and I'll, he, uh, at, and at, the, at the core of that comment was, uh, culturally, we're self-reliant. We're full of pride. We don't want to ask for help. Right? Does anyone have any comments to that? Yes? Did you? Yeah. Yeah, Radley? Yeah, I think very much supports that not having the tools, but actually almost kind of intransigence in a way. You know, start feeling the need to kind of reach out, go outside your comfort zone, but also at the end of the day sort of going back to a, what, is it a kind of defensiveness or self-reliance? So some, some, some boundary really in intransigence, just despite putting out some feelers towards a broader... Right. Perspective. Right. You know, um, if I can <laughs> sort of put this in acting 101 terms for a second, uh, at the core of every character, really of every human being, is a want, right? And uh, there's, there's what what's makes drama interesting <laughs> and what creates tension is obstacles getting in the way of that want, right? So really, that's a question we can be asking ourselves here. What, what are the obstacles in the way of these individuals getting what they want? Yes?
pieces are so large, I mean, I just know how very much it is related to agriculture. Mm -hmm. Let's, we can practice that a little bit here today, right? Um, how do we talk to these individuals? How do we get the same message across to them? What, what, well, here's a question. What is a message we want to get across to, any, to all three of these individuals? Just You can answer as an individual as well. Yeah. Yes? Great. It's a conversation you have. It's a conversation you have with the family about what it's worth now. Like I say, people are building things on the strip. If, do you want to sell it? Uh, you know, the market is strong in Rocky Point at the moment, but got all the science and everything. Yeah, at the moment, but wait a few years and <laughs> some people. So you're suggesting I should find somebody and sell my house? Okay, I don't. Yeah, but I don't see them. So I've got a new person in my house, and they've got to deal with managed retreat as well. It solves my problem, except that I don't have well, my summer home. Talk to your <laughs> city council person. Yeah. Yeah. She should be Great. I want to. Yeah. Great. I want to interject quickly. Uh, was that was that response satisfying to you? Or, and when when I say satisfying, let me be clear. When I say satisfying, not did you like it, but did it ring true? Uh, That's okay. Um, th does, does anybody have a differing uh, opinion to, to Jim's response there? Does anybody recognize this response? I'm seeing some nodding heads, right? So, so there's a hurdle we've got there, right? Yes? Well, no, that's not the outcome. I think like most people, I want to die in my bed a long time in the future. But I would love to have any conversation that makes the flooding stop. Um, because most of what I'm hearing is my options are sell the house to somebody who is going to get forced out, which certainly beats me being forced out. I agree with that. Or drowning in my bed. Or my, and this is the other thing, everybody says, well, it's two years, it's five years, it's 20 years. Um, you know, 
I've got grandkids now. Are the great grandkids going to be the ones when it all goes away? And they will not be drowning in the bed. But, <laughs> you know, I, and I don't know what to do. But if somebody had, what I want is it to stop. That's what I want. I want my house. How do we help him alleviate that concern? What, what does the room say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's what I'm hearing here, and I guess, as I'm, this, God knows I'm not good at that, but is, you know, we're talking about organizing locally and talking to the politicians and city government people. Like I say, every time you turn around, there's some big condo unit going up on the strip. And from what I've heard, that's bad for the rest of the town. Uh, so it does seem to me organizing politically, which is not some, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if I mean if some, that I need, I want answers. I want somebody to tell me something that will. I mean, I do, I want somebody to tell me something that will stop it, but slow it down, maybe see what changes. I mean, the longer till change, maybe things get better. Uh, what, 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 are we, what are we learning from Jimmy's response? Anybody? Are, are you learning anything new? <laughs> I had the same thought. I, does anybody have any thoughts about that? Yeah? I wanted to just take a quick. I'm with Jimmy. I think that if you're not acting as elected official, it helps Jimmy. Like then the government is sure with Jimmy's big problem. I think he's Jimmy is sincere. He said everybody tells him giving all the options, but nobody say anything about the government all building the structure that's needed for me to save my house. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear Jimmy saying. You know, mm -hmm. and I think we need to talk to Susan over there about civic leaders. Well, <laughs> well, hot. How do, we how, how do we empower Susan? What questions do we ask Susan? Or what more do we want to know about Susan? Yes. That's a great question for Susan. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm working on the school budget right now. Um, I feel like uh, this, is, this is a part of my job that it just makes me want to quit um, because of the pressures. Um, and, and I can hear you laughing. It's not funny. You know, it, like, like uh, with most people, it takes all my time to do the things that I need to do short term, and this is a big picture thing. Um, and there's so many pieces that needs to be organized. I was thinking about it the other day, and I was thinking about it's like buying a house, right? There's what you can, what you want, which is the scientists, what you can afford, which is the town, 
And then the variables, which are the residents and, you know, when you're buying a house, how the market, and there are all these variables, and there's nobody in the middle like the realtor helping us negotiate the deal, right? Um, so that's for me. And we're leaving, I feel like I'm getting bombarded by the scientists and by the residents. Great. I want to acknowledge what just happened in the room. We created some tension, right? Is that familiar to anyone? <laughs> Jimmy's. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to ignore that tension that was just created. Because that's what we're here to talk about, right? How do we talk about that tension we just created between these two human beings? How do we address that? Yeah. Mm. All three of these people are competing time in radically different ways. Susan is like many government officials careering from crisis to crisis, moment to moment. Uh, Catherine is a scientist, scales time, the way she thinks about time. Mm -hmm. Personal for her, time isn't time, it's geologic. Mm. Time for Jimmy is about his great-grandchildren. And so there, there's no common language for how to deal with time in this creative and dramatic tension. That's a lovely point. Our, our, our vocabulary, although we may be using the same word, that word has different meanings, right? Thank you. Uh, yes, in the back. I've created it. She's just not using it. <laughs> Do you have a response to that? I just want to acknowledge a new moment of tension we created in the room, though, right? Before you answer that question, Susan, um, uh, do, you, do you know Catherine um, in the community? Yeah, she's um, been doing some sort of research project in town. Okay, I just wanted to create that context. <laughs> and if you could answer Gary's question. <laughs> um, so to, to underscore your question, did, is, is there anything you might want to ask her, if you could? I'm hearing maybe um, you should. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a good question. I, I really don't know how to, um, to ask her. You know, uh, it seems like she just drops the stuff on my desk, and then I don't know what to do with it. And it doesn't seem to. We've had some town halls with residents, but I think, you know, the same people always show up. That it, it has to be more involving the resident. Every, every resident knows their property really well. And is there a way to have, to do different kinds of things, right? It, what we're doing isn't working. And I don't know how to really engage in that 
with um, Catherine. Um, Great. How would you how would you qualify the or 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 label what's going on with Susan? What's the emotion at the core of her inertia? I heard overwhelming. Inadequacy. Anything else? Fear. Denial is another word. Frustration, Frustration fear, denial. Ooh, these are these are some big. Lack of leadership. Oh. What else? <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you for that perspective. Yeah, your hand was up. Yes. And there's this question, too, of where do these conversations take place? Is it another town hall? Is it, is it, you know, is it at the grocery store? <laughs> is it at the beach on a Sunday afternoon? Where do these conversations take place between these two stakeholders? Uh, yes. Susan, can I can I ask? Did you anticipate having to deal with any of these issues when you took this office? Not 30 years ago, no. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Do you feel equipped to address them? No. Mm -hmm. No. I I just need a, we need help. Obviously, it's costing the town a lot of money to keep repairing the road. By uh, Susan, are you are you scared? Yeah. To? What are you scared of? I'm, I'm, you know, I have about five more years before I retire, and, <laughs> I, and, and I, I, you know, I don't want to leave a mess, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to, to, my hope in terms of a legacy would be to start a conversation and to build some sort of. Uh, infrastructure that we can at least engage in a conversation but I don't know how to go about doing that right. and I keep asking for help and there's no place to go to get the help that I need right. thanks uh, Catherine uh, in this room full of trusted confidants what are you afraid of that my work means nothing hmm. I think um, I kind of feel like everybody's looking to me for the answers, and I feel like I have them, and I don't, I think. Thanks. How do we address these fears as, as individuals and as people who may be thrust into working together? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
currently we, we're we're looking at 30 to 40 percent of the town. Uh, my, the area where my research has been is of high economic level. So those are the numbers that I know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I'm curious too about uh, your own response as an individual to these characters' fears. Do you feel equipped to have a conversation with any, any of these folks about those fears and those concerns and those frustrations? Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yes. Great, thanks. Is, is the room generally familiar with the idea of motivational interviewing? Uh, at its core, um, from, from what little I know about it, uh, is it's essentially, it's essentially getting uh, the person who is smoking three packs a day to be the one that voices the, pack, the fact that they have, that that's not good for them, right? It's coaching, uh, coaching that information out of the other. And really, at its core, it's about listening, right? And, it's, and in order to do that, it does require vulnerability and patience, which doesn't always go hand in hand with urgency, right? Um, Do we want to see, while we have them here, a conversation between Catherine and Susan? Yes. Great. Are you guys up for that? Uh, sure. I, I, I've been wanting to ask the woman who asked the question, um, which I thought was a great question. What question would you like to see me ask Catherine? Thanks. Um, and is there any, anything that anyone wants to equip Catherine with as she enters this conversation? Yes. Hello, Catherine. You're not in the women's group. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Jim, can you just step aside? Thanks. Yeah. Did you, did you have a suggestion, though? Now, we're, 
we're also we're going to ask our actors to just talk, have as truthful a conversation as they can. We're not going to wave any magic wands here. So this might be satisfying. It might not. Let's see what happens. Yep, yeah, quickly. We might need another hour. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really get a chance to tell you, but the community really appreciates the work that you're doing. So we don't often get a chance to tell you that, but we recognize the, the tireless work that you do for us, even though we don't get a chance to see you, but we really appreciate the work that you do for us. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Susan, I know you didn't have a lot of time today, so I just, I really appreciate the time and I wanted to just start by saying, I know a lot of people don't tell you that we really appreciate what you do. Yeah. <laughs> I see it, I see you, yep. I see you doing that. So even though we've maybe not seen eye to eye in the past or things have gone a little tense, that last town meeting actually scared me a bit, but um, <laughs> I, I really appreciate you. Well, um, I, I appreciate all the work that you do too, and uh, but I'm, I and I see how much you care, and how passionate you are about the, this issue, but you've given me um, this paper, and I I really I don't understand exactly how um, based on uh, there's such a gap between this and where we need to get to. I, you know I understand that there's a problem. This is an important issue but I don't really understand the action items that you think are most important. Okay, that, that's frustrating for me to hear because those action points were created in committee by, by not just me, we had yourself and your colleagues on that committee as well. <laughs> you put this on my shoulders and I, I don't... I think it's on all our shoulders and um, yeah, I, I can see that you're frustrated, and I'm frustrated too. I just uh, don't know how we move forward, and if there's, um, I, I feel like you get really frustrated with, there's a lot at play here, um, and a lot of different perspectives that need to be represented. So, I think the way forward is clear. It's mapped out in this document that we sat and created together. You need to be talking to the residents about the finances of this situation. We need to be talking taxes, Susan, come on. Yeah, I know, but I, I think we need to engage the residents more in the whole dialogue. Well, if you're gonna roll your eyes, I, I'm, uh, I think, thanks for coming Great. in. Hold right there, great. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what happened or didn't happen? What did you observe? Are you, was that satisfying? Did we make any waves? What were some of the sticking points? What were some of the obstacles that came up? Yeah? Right. We get in these silos, right? We invest our lives into them. And it's very, very hard to, I'm going to mix metaphors here, it's very hard to sort of jump tracks, right? Once that, <laughs> sure. Um, we are at time, unfortunately. 
Um, I wish we could continue this conversation for another hour and dig into these characters some more. Uh, very, very quickly, just some observations I made from this conversation. Uh, I really was very struck by a couple of moments of tension that we had between us as an audience and these characters. I don't think you can ignore those. I hope you have an opportunity to discuss those amongst yourselves. Um, I'm, I'm very appreciative for this group uh, talking about some of the more uh, uh, tense uh, emotional aspects of this, notably fear, vulnerability, denial. Those are very powerful motivators, and they're also very, very powerful demotivators. So I hope you can continue talking about those too. I also want to uh, underscore the importance of listening. I think in this scene, we just saw two people who were not listening to each other. And what are the obstacles that are in the way of that? Um, I also want to quickly, very quickly acknowledge too, um, the fact that there are so many variables when it comes to these conversations. The characters you saw were based on people that we talk to in the community that we live in. Uh, this could be a very different set of perspectives if this work is done in another community. It's not, it's not an issue that always looks like this. In fact, it never does. It does where we live. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that there is a wider, diverse, more diverse range of perspectives uh, that weren't necessarily heard today. So I hope you can continue to talk about that as well. Um, I also want to quickly give the actors just a chance to introduce themselves before we wrap up. I'm Jim Sears. I'm an actor from New Hampshire. I have been with Power Play since the beginning. You guys were great. Thank you. I'm Catherine Stewart. I'm a playwright and director and the Associate Artistic Director of New Hampshire Theatre Project, an applied theatre company based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. My name is Susan Poulin, and uh, I've been involved with Power Play since the beginning. I'm passionate about this kind of work. And um, I'm also a writer, performer, and humorist, and I live in southern Maine. Great, thanks. Um, and again, uh, my, uh, my name's C.J. Lewis. I run the Power Play Interactive Development Program. Also, um, some of the core members of our team were uh, David Kay, who founded the program at the University of New Hampshire in 2013, as well as Cameron Wake and Julia Peterson, as well, who are here with us this weekend. Um, so, uh, very big thanks to Columbia and the Earth Institute, and also um, to the Consensus Building Institute for uh, supporting this work as well. So, thank you all very much. Have a good, have a good night.